Today I would like to share with you the story of one of the greatest athletes in the history of strength sports. This man spent nearly 30 years training in total solitude with one singular goal, to become the best deadlifter ever. He built his own equipment, developed his own techniques, and through sheer determination, made a lift which was not matched in the pre-steroid era. This is the story of Bob Peoples. Bob was born in rural Tennessee in 1910. He was raised on a farm which had him doing physical work from a young age. The boy was fed a nourishing diet of fresh meat and produce, so he no doubt had the right environment to grow strong. His first taste of strength training came in the form of a pair of 50 pound dumbbells his father owned. One day while in town, young Bob got his hands on a copy of Physical Culture magazine. This would serve as his first introduction to the concept of progressive resistance. Having mastered the 50 pound dumbbells, he quickly realized that if he wanted to keep getting stronger, he would have to get access to more weights. He would have loved a set of plate loaded barbells and dumbbells, but it was a luxury his humble family couldn't afford. So Bob responded to the challenge by building his own equipment. With a metal bar and two wooden drums, he fashioned a barbell, which he could fill with rocks to progressively overload his training. He used this makeshift bar for many years. He did all sorts of exercises, but one movement in particular piqued his interest above all others. The deadlift. By the time Bob reached high school, he could lift this bar loaded up to around 450 pounds, at a body weight of just around 165 pounds. While his lifting was rather inconsistent for several years after high school due to the demands of his family's farm, by the time he was 25 years old, he was ready to make his training a priority again. This is also when he began methodically logging his lifts. Bob's training was unique in more ways than one. He never had a coach, lifting buddy, or a spotter. He always trained in total solitude, either in his basement or outside. We'll get into the specifics of his techniques a bit later, but just keep in mind as we go along that everything Bob did, he had to figure out on his own. He may have learned the most basic principles from magazines, however everything beyond that was a product of his own curiosity and experimentation. His first competition came in 1939, when at the age of 29, he entered the Tennessee State Olympic Lifting Championship. He actually won the light heavyweight class, but the deadlift continued to be his true passion. So even though it wasn't a part of the competition, he took the opportunity to show off his favorite movement by doing an exhibition deadlift of 600 pounds after the contest. Apparently this was quite an easy lift for him. Then World War II erupted and Bob got drafted for service. However, during his medical exam, the doctors discovered an obstructed kidney tube, which made him ineligible and also meant he needed to have major abdominal surgery. As he was recovering from this ordeal, which involved a massive 18 inch incision, his doctor told him he could never lift weights again. But of course, Bob wasn't going to let something as silly as major abdominal surgery hold him back. By the very next month, he was back to lifting his barbell. Though once again, his training would be very sporadic as the war put tremendous pressure on farmers. By 1946, he was 36 years old. All distractions and obstacles were finally behind him. He had one singular goal in mind, to set the deadlift world record by breaking the 700 pound barrier. That year, he once again did an exhibition deadlift at the the state Olympic lifting championship, this time pulling 651 and three quarter pounds at a body weight of 180 and a half pounds. Then the following year in 1947, Bob had an epic showdown with a massive 275 pound lifter from Louisiana called Bill Boone 
who was also vying for the deadlift record. This was an official contest with three judges held in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Bill Boone went first and set a new record at 680 pounds. Then it was Bob's turn and he went straight for 700 pounds. Remember Bob weighed just 180 pounds still so his opponent was 50% heavier than him. It was quite the grind but he made the lift, setting an even higher record record by quite a margin. Apparently the photographer who was there didn't manage to snap a picture of Bob's lift. So what did he do? He lifted the bar again a second time and this picture you're seeing is just that. Now the crazy part about all this is that they only weighed the bar and the plates after the contest and it turns out it was one pound short, meaning Bob only lifted 699 pounds that day and the mythical 700 pound barrier was still standing, though not for long. The climax of Bob's lifting career came in 1949, when at a show in his hometown, surrounded by his friends and neighbors, he deadlifted an unbelievable 725 and 3 quarter pounds, at a body weight of 181 pounds. At just over 4 times body weight, this would be Bob's heaviest official lift, and it set a record which stood for over 25 years, solidifying his spot as one of the greatest deadlifters in history. He absolutely smoked everyone in the pre-steroid era. At this point, Bob was 40 years old. Considering he started training as a kid, it took him nearly three decades to peak in strength, and should be a lesson for anyone who thinks they've hit their prime in their 20s. Bob's physique looked pretty much exactly as you would expect of someone with such an obsession for deadlifting. He didn't look like a bodybuilder. His arms and legs weren't particularly impressive, but my gosh, look at this guy's back just insanely wide and dense. This will make even more sense once we get into his deadlift technique. But before we get into that and his inventions he used to achieve this legendary strength, first a quick anecdote from his wife. She tells a funny story about how Bob would often get furious with himself when he missed a lift or plateaued for a while, something I'm sure we've all experienced. Well, what Bob would often do is pack up all his weights and throw them down the hill on his farm into a ditch, swearing never to lift again. Inevitably though, after a couple days and some reflection, he would get motivated again, and his wife would watch him out the window as he hauled all the weights back up the hill and got his ass back in the gym, training harder than ever. Alright, so Bob was a true pioneer of the iron game. His environment and ingenuity sparked some serious out-of-the-box thinking. He's credited with inventing several bits of equipment which we still use today. Many of these pictures will be from a 1952 article in Iron Man magazine, which was kindly provided to me by GoldenEraBookworm.com. You guys can check out the website if you want to purchase the full magazine or lots of other old school muscle mags. So first of all, Bob invented the power rack. Yup, that's right, one of the most basic and essential pieces of equipment which pretty much all of us use every time we train was invented by Bob Peoples in his basement. It consisted of two hardwood posts which were fixed to a wall. These posts had holes bored in them every couple of inches so he could place pins to hold his barbell at various heights. He even built a system of safety bars, so it really was like a fully functioning modern squat rack. This allowed him to do all the heavy movements he wanted by himself, without having to worry about getting stuck under the bar. Another issue Bob ran into was holding the bar in his hands when doing higher rep sets of deadlifts. Not wanting to limit the potential of his posterior chain to what his fingers could hold onto, he built a hook that he could strap to his wrist. This little device took the load of the barbell out of his hands and put it on his wrists. So Bob Peoples is also credited with inventing lifting straps. And it doesn't stop there. 
When you look up the history of the trap bar online, you'll find all the sources pointing to Al Gerard inventing it in the mid-1980s. But listen to this quote from Bob in the Iron Man article from 1952. I also built what I called a ring bar. This was a large ring of steel to which I fastened two short bars, one on each side, on which I could load plates. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds suspiciously like a trap bar to me. He doesn't get the credit for it, but I think Bob figured out the trap bar a couple decades before Al Gerard. He built pretty much all the equipment he used. He even made a leg press. You have to be pretty clever to figure all this out on your own and use your unique system to become one of the strongest men in history, making Bob a great example of brains and brawn. Back to this famous deadlift, let's take a quick look at Bob's training methods. I think at this point you guys probably won't be surprised to hear that he experimented with many different training styles. Particularly his deadlift technique was very much out of the ordinary. He would study his body's leverage and center of gravity closely with a mirror while lifting. He experimented with different grips, different height shoes, various starting positions, inhaling fully, exhaling fully, and everything in between. He found the safest way he could lift the most weight was actually to go barefoot, use a hook grip, exhale fully, round the back, and lift with little bend in the knees, which definitely reflected in his physique. This is pretty much the opposite of what is considered the correct way to deadlift, and it was back then too. But Bob wasn't worried about the right or wrong way to do things. He experimented a lot and simply did what worked best for him. In terms of his workouts, they usually consisted of very few exercises with low reps and heavy weights. He liked doing heavy singles and often no more than three to five rep sets. He did the basics, squat, deadlift, and presses with a couple very specific variations which he did often, like half squats and half deadlifts. He trained most days or as much as his work allowed. His program was never really set in stone, and a lot of it was based on instinct. He was a big believer in advanced lifters finding their own path with an individualistic and creative approach. There's quite a bit more information out there on his specific programming techniques. I won't cover them all here, but I will leave some links in the description if you're interested in finding out more. I also recommend you check out an excellent set of articles on Bob written by Terry Todd and Paul Anderson in Muscular Development Magazine, who of course were both legends in their own right and took major inspiration from Bob. And finally, don't forget Bob's own book called Developing Physical Strength. Bob Peoples was not a professional athlete, and you won't find him on the cover of any muscle magazines. He was just a normal guy with a job and a family. Family, who happened to have a deep ambition to pull the heaviest deadlift. And he did just that. It took him decades to slowly and very methodically chip away at his goal. But by the end, he stood in a league of his own. Still a normal guy, but also the best deadlifter the world had ever seen. And along the way, he invented things which you and I still use every week. So next time you're loading up the bar in the squat rack or strapping up for some heavy deadlifts, spare a thought for the great Bob Peoples. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching.